So you're turning there to 2 Kings 5, 2 Kings 5, and we're, we're going to spend, uh, well, if you want to keep your finger there, but we're going to be focused on 2 Kings 5, uh, we'll be jumping around as uh, we always do, but, and the title of the sermon this, uh, this morning is Naaman, Saved by Grace, and it's in my daily Bible reading, I don't know, this story just, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago that I actually read this, but I've been coming back to it and coming back to it in my mind as something that just really stands out to me. And what's interesting about this story is that it's a great, uh, it's a great, uh, it's a great way to see salvation in the Old Testament, but it's also a great way to see a lot of the things that we're going to encounter in life as far as false gospels, uh, how we should deal with people. There's, there's a lot of interesting characters and a lot of things are going on right here. And the reason that I'm preaching this is earlier this week I got a call uh, from a friend of mine who's just kind of giving me a hard time because, uh, you know, some of the things that, you know, that I preach behind the pulpit and he wasn't quite in a, you know, he didn't quite agree with these things. And a couple of things that, that uh, you know, he was giving me a hard time about are things that maybe you've heard of or not, but, you know, I'm going to touch it in at the end, but we're going to address it with this, with this, uh, with this account here in 2 Kings 5. Uh, from Naaman, who's from Syria, and so I'll touch on that at the end, but uh, if you'll go there to verse 14, we're going to focus on those verses, and then I'm going to touch on, uh, we're going to go through the entire chapter, but not, you know, verse by verse, but there in, in uh, verse 14 of Second Kings 5, it says, and this is talking of Naaman, and if you don't know the story, I'm just going to give you the quick synopsis, obviously Naaman is a great guy, and we're going to touch on that, and, but he has leprosy, and he's a Syrian, he's not of the, he's not either an, an Israelite or of the tribe of Judah, uh, he just serves in the kingdom of Syria. But uh, he finds he has a, he has leprosy. There's a maid that he has, or a maiden from the land of Israel, and she says, "Look, if we could get him to the prophet, we could get him to that land. God would he, uh, heal him of his leprosy." So this becomes the rumor. It gets to the king, the uh, Syrian king, and so he sends a letter to the king of Israel saying, hey, I'm sending you my servant Naaman, and I want you to heal him. So then the king of Israel kind of freaks out. He's like, whoa, is this guy trying to start a war with me? Because what does he expect of me? I'm just a king. I'm not God. How can I heal this guy of leprosy? But in the process, Elijah, and this is S-H-A, not Elijah, Elijah, who was the one who served Elijah, he says, don't worry about it. Send him my way. I know we're, you know, things are going to get taken care of. And then he gives him this instruction, and Naaman kind of has a bad attitude about it, and we'll, we'll touch on that. I don't want to get too deep into it. But then we get, they, they convince him to finally do the thing that he's been asked to do, and we see this here in, in 2 Kings 5, verse 14. It says, Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And so we see that Naaman is not only healed, but then he recognizes God Almighty. And there's some back and forth here. And I wish I could touch on it all. And this is a great uh, set of scripture to just come back several times. I mean, I could have done a whole different sermon just on the characters alone. And, you know, just the different types of personalities you're going to deal with. But just a couple of things to touch on real quick is, you know, Naaman, in verse 1 it says, of Second Kings 5, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given him deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So what's interesting is he's a mighty man in the kingdom of Syria, even though he's a leper. But the reason that there was deliverance is because the Lord had, uh, because the Lord had given him deliverance. In other words, the Lord had found him honorable, even though he's not saved at the time. You know, the Lord showed grace, and this is a great picture of how salvation is for all who believe, right? But not just for all who believe, for everybody who's also lost in the world. As long as they're willing to listen to the gospel and believe on Jesus Christ, they can be saved. You know, the children of Israel were the God's chosen people in the Old Testament as far as a race. But that doesn't mean that God ever excluded, every, excluded everybody else from salvation. Obviously, we see this picture 
where God has favor on someone who's not an Israelite, who's not of the kingdom of Judah, who's not of the kingdom of Israel. The Bible says, for, uh, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever. And that's one of the, the, the I guess, one of the arguments you're going to get from all, a lot of false doctrines or a lot of false things. And one of the things I'm going to touch on in, in the end of this is this thing called Lordship Salvation, where people uh, get onto you that, you know, you need to believe that God or Jesus is Lord of your life. And if, if there's no visible change, if you've not done certain things in your life and Jesus is not Lord of your life, then you never were really saved. Well, I mean, here, Naaman, it, Jesus is not Lord of his life. Naaman is serving the king of Syria. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see later in the story that he kind of has a bad attitude about what he has to do to get clean from leprosy. But, you know, we're not going to get it. Uh, we'll touch on that here in a little bit. Then we see Elijah. He's the messenger. He's the prophet. He's the guy who's been given the, the, the I guess, the power and the, the, the message to heal uh, Naaman. And one of the things that we also see is that Elijah is not impressed by the Syrian. As a matter of fact, we'll see in verses where he didn't even meet uh, Naaman at the door. He just sent a messenger. And one of the things that we need to understand is that we shouldn't be respecter of people. And we should, you know, uh, not be impressed by people who show up with money or fame or celebrity status. And then the other thing about Elijah is, you know, for those that are in the ministry in any capacity, not just in, behind the pulpit, but just even if you're out soul winning, if you're serving, if you're raising a family, is that you're going to do the most important thing first. You know, he didn't stop doing what he was doing just to meet this great guy and greet him and give him like all this feast and everything. He kept doing what he was doing. And then the other challenge we see, and I'm, that's why I said we're just going to touch on this briefly. In the meantime, turn over to Leviticus 13, Leviticus 13. But we also see Gehazi, he's the servant of uh, Elijah. And Gehazi is all about money. And basically, you know, he serves Elijah only to his benefit. And it kind of gives us this picture of even Judas betraying Jesus Christ. And so I, the reason I touch on that briefly is because we're probably not going to come back to that anymore. I want to focus on Naaman and just what, what, his, uh, what his account is here in uh, 2 Kings 5. But a couple of things, you know, leprosy in the Bible is a picture of sin. We see that throughout the entire Bible. We see that even in the New Testament. And being healed of leprosy is a picture of salvation and how Jesus cleanses from that sin. You know, obviously we know it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, but that's what leprosy, you know, is one of, the, one of the symbolic things of leprosy in the Bible is that it symbolizes sin. And then when there's cleansing of it is that Jesus cleanses us of all sin. And we're there in Leviticus and Leviticus 13 is that chapter in the Bible that actually deals with the Levitical law of how to deal with leprosy and the, and the uh, uh, how to treat someone that has leprosy. And we're not going to go through it all, obviously. You know, that's a lot of verses. But there in verse 1 of uh, Leviticus 13, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of, of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, and unto one of his sons the priest. And so here, um, you know, when people have leprosy, it's the priest, that's why it is a picture, it's the priest who had to look upon it and tell them how to either heal it or separate themselves for a time to see if there was going to be healing. If you go down to verse 12, and the reason I chose Leviticus, I could have gone for the medical definition, but I wanted to give you the biblical definition of leprosy. That's what really we're looking at here. Leviticus 13 verse 12 says, And if a leprosy break out abroad in the skin, and the leprosy cover all the skin of him that hath the plague from his head even unto his foot, Wheresoever the priest looketh, then the priest shall consider, and behold, if the leprosy have covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is all turned white, he is clean. But when raw flesh appeareth in him, he shall be unclean. And the priest shall see the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean, it is a leprosy. So from this picture, and just go to verse 45, but for this, from this picture here we see that it's not a very uh, comfortable disease, and it's not something pleasant to look at. You know, obviously, we could, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it, it's not a great thing to have leprosy. And, and according to this, also, it's not a great thing to be around someone who has uh, leprosy. And we also know that it's contagious and all these things. And verse 45 says, you know, we just see this. This is what they would do in those times. It says, and the leper in whom is the plague, 
And the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. They're making him wear a mask and say, hey, you're not, you need to tell us that you're not clean. We need to get some social distancing. You just, it, you know, there is some biblical truth to some of the things. I mean, they've exaggerated this, right? But all the days wherein the plague shall be in, in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp shall be his, shall his habitation be. And so this is a picture of, obviously, if you're unclean and you're not clean by Jesus Christ, you're without the camp. And that's a picture of not being in the kingdom or being cast into outer darkness, um, you know. And then turn over to Luke 7. Luke 7, what's interesting is we see this uh, here. Uh, and we see that in Luke 7, John sends his disciples to meet Jesus and to verify that that is Jesus. And I think it's interesting the response that Jesus gives those, uh, those uh, disciples. It says in Luke 7, verse 18, it says, And the disciples of John showed him all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how the blind see and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, to the, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he who shall, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And I think it's interesting that Christ does all these miracles in front of them when they're trying to verify if he is the Messiah. And then he does these things and then he tells them, go tell, go tell John these specific things. And what's interesting is if you tie it to the gospel, it says, then Jesus said, go your way and tell John the things you've seen, how the blind see. Hey, I was once blind, but now I see. You know, we know that famous hymn. They see the everlasting life. It says, the lame walk. The only way to walk righteous is to have Christ in our life. You know, people want to prove their works and say, did we not do these great things? Aren't we li But if you're not living, if you don't have Christ in your life, it's all in vain. It's, it's without purpose. It says the lepers are cleansed. And like I said, it's a picture of sin. It says the deaf hear. The Bible tells us that we need to hear the gospel. And then it says, and the dead are raised. What is that? What, what are we looking forward to? That second coming of Jesus Christ. Right? We'll never taste death, and then one day our soul, our incorruptible soul, will be joined with an incorruptible body. And it says, to the poor, the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And so we see that this is a spiritual tie-in to what he does. And so, I mean, obviously he sends them back. But I just got three points for you today. And they're based right there. If you, uh, if you go, if you want to keep your finger in Second Kings, like I said earlier, but also turn your book over to Luke four. You're already in Luke, so just go back to four. But in Second Kings five, we're going to look at verse one, and it says, "Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord, and if you notice that word is capitalized, Lord, it's talking about God, had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also mighty in valor." but he was a leper. So the first point I'm going to leave you with today is, are you going to be mighty in the world or are we going to be meek in spirit? You know, the Bible talks about in Matthew 5, blessed are those that are meek, right? And in Luke 4, uh, 16, we see that tie-in and uh, we see the mention of uh, Naaman. And it says, and he came to Nazareth, this is Jesus, where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue, and this is Luke 4, verse 16. Luke 4, verse 16, in case I didn't tell you. Uh, and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So we see that this is a co consistent message of Jesus Christ. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted 
to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the ministers and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness, all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceedeth out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye shall ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And pay attention. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eluazus, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him to the brow of a hill, the brow of a hill, whereunto their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went to his way. And I wish we could spend time on the fact that Jesus basically disappeared from their midst. But we see here, he names Naaman, and we, this is a picture of, hey, you guys had your opportunity. Israel at this time and even Judah keep bouncing back and forth. And, and, you know, when you read 2 Kings and when you read the Chronicles and when you read Samuel, you know, they just keep bouncing back and forth. They're stiff-necked and then they, they, they come back to the Lord. But every time they come back a little bit less. You know, it says this king was, did righteous in the Lord or did right in the eyes of the Lord, but he didn't tear down the groves or he didn't turn, te uh, tear down the high places and he didn't do these things. And they get mad because he basically calls them out. He's like, look, in Israel, there was these things, and you guys rejected them, and even then they still rejected them. And so we need to be meek when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just for salvation, but also for growth, for our spiritual walk. And we're going to see that transformation in Naaman, right? Naaman kind of goes through this, this, this transformation, but it shows that he was a good leader, because even in his fault, he's able to recover and get the thing complete. Go to 2 Kings. Go back to 2 Kings. And also we'll be in John 10. But go back to 2 Kings and we're going to look there in verse 9. In verse 9 of, of 2 Kings, it says, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times. And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and far, far, far par rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went, uh, so he turned and went away in a rage. That's sometimes what happens when we're preaching the gospel. You know, we, we, when you tell someone the truth, sometimes they get a little angry. I mean, I've been in situations where I'm telling someone, the, the, you know, giving someone the gospel, and, and, the, and, and all of a sudden they get violent. And you know what we need to be is we need to be like Elijah. We need to be a little bit patient and graceful and not just write them off immediately. Because sometimes the truth is a little bit hard to handle. And that leads me to my second point real quick is, are you going to be dormant or are you going to be at the door? You know, we see here in 2 Kings verse 9, I mean, 2 Kings 5 verse 9, it says, Naaman came with his horses. Now, Naaman didn't just show up by himself. I mean, he showed up with an entourage. So this is like a big deal. And the reason I keep jump, bouncing back and forth between the New Testament with the New Testament and the Old, excuse me, is um, I got a scratchy throat, but <clears throat> there we go. The reason I keep jumping back and forth is, what is this? What's going on here? You know, I mean, you see that uh, Naaman shows up in a big, you know, in a big entourage. And what were the Jews? 
or the Sadducees and the Pharisees, what were they looking for when they ran into Jesus? They, they, didn't, they were looking for the Messiah to come in with an entourage, kind of like how Naaman showed up with horses and chariots, you know, a knight in shining armor. And Jesus came on the scene and he was humble and meek. And he was, uh, you know, with the people and he was a servant, you know, and he was healing the blind and, and doing all these miracles. And they didn't like that. They didn't want to admit that because they were like, that's not our Messiah. That's not who we were expecting on the scene. And that's exactly what happened here with Naaman for a minute. He says, man, I thought this guy was going to do these great things. He didn't even come out to greet me. And then he says, what does he say? But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. You know, Naaman shows up. He's heard these rumors that he can get healed. And then he's heard of this, these prophets and what he thinks he's coming to like this like entertainment show isn't that what christianity is like today you know people are showing up they want like this this entertainment uh, uh society you know you show up to church and they want the lights and the spirit i was watching a clip earlier i didn't even know that they still did this but you know pastor you probably heard of the holy rollers and i'm watching a clip and they're singing the song it is well with my soul it's like a like an old baptist church uh and i guess uh, they're singing and the guy's getting real excited. And then all of a sudden, he just disappears from the camera because he starts running around the church. You know, that's not the way that, it, that this is, uh, you know, that's just all fluff. It's all feeling. And I'm not saying that I'm not, you know, don't be, I don't want you to be like dull for the Lord. But don't over-exaggerate it. I mean, just let the Lord do what he's going to do. And sometimes that's what people want is that outward appearance. Oh, I got saved. The day that I got saved, you know, I saw a light come down and a thunderstorm came in and lightning struck. No, you just believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no, I don't have to visibly see an outward change for no, to know that you're saved. That's what Naaman's looking for. He's like, and, and nothing's happening. And I mean, and he's, I mean, he, this is serious. He's wroth. You know, that's, he, he he's, 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 in, he's not just angry. He's like in a blind rage. The Bible says there, he says, so he turned and went away in a rage. I mean, he's like fired up. Go to John 10 and, and just a, a real quick tie into that verse 9 where he says he stood at the door in the house of Elijah. I think that's an interesting that, he made, that they make mention of that because if you go to John 10 verse 1, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in, the, in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by his name, and leadeth them out. And when, he puff, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go, out, go, shall go in and out and find pastor. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. And I, I like this picture, because look, Naaman, he's a powerful leader. I mean, he's been in war. You think he couldn't have overtaken Elijah's house? I mean, I, Elijah's a prophet of Christ, so I'm not imagining that he has this big mansion fortified, you know, with guards and everything. He probably just lives a, a normal life. You know, he doesn't have, like, bodyguards. Naaman has bodyguards. Elijah doesn't. So, you know, the Bible says that, he, that the thief comes in to destroy and kill. Look, if Naaman really wanted to just do it by works, he would have just forced the issue. He could have broken down. He could have grabbed Elijah by the neck and said, hey, you're going to heal me one way or another. That's the devil's way of doing things. That's how the devil wants to convince you that you need to do, go about living your Christian life. You know, I actually like that Naamath 
was angry, but he just went away. He went to think about it. You know, I mean, I don't know. He's just, he's like, I, I'm just, I don't have time for this either. You know, that shows his leadership in the sense that, you know, if you're angry, just move on to the next thing. Now, the other thing that shows his leadership, and it's the third point. So, you know, the very first thing that we were talking about was, you know, are you mighty or meek? And I did an, an, an alliteration, um, you know, just for the points. But really, I'm just focusing, just focus on the main things. But, you know, are you dormant or at the door? And then the final point is foolish or faithful. And this is where Naaman shows his leadership skills. And, you know, one of the things about a leader is also being a good follower. You know, everybody wants that position of leadership, and they don't know what it entails or what it comes with. And then if they're not prepared, they get it, and they're going to break under the pressure. You know, leadership entails a lot of following. People don't realize that, but people that have a position of leadership also follow a lot. Because in, a, in, in order for you to delegate things out, whether you're in a position here at a church or you're the CEO of a company or you're leading a home, you know what you have to do? You have to follow the things that you delegate out, right? I mean, if not, you've ever heard that saying, you know, if I want it done right, I got to do it myself. Well, you know what happens when you're doing it yourself? You're overdoing it because you spread yourself too thin. Sometimes I'd rather get it done okay than do it right myself because at least it's going to get done, right? Oh, I'm the best soul winner, or I'm the best preacher, or I'm the best pew sitter. You know, I, nobody can sit in church like I can sit. I mean, I don't know, whatever it is that you, that you think you can do better. Just trust, you know, and follow. But go there back to 2 Kings 5, verse 13. 2 Kings 5, and we're there in verse 13. Like I said, we want to focus on Naaman. I mean, there's so much in 2 Kings 5 that I know for sure I'll come back and preach another sermon just on that alone. But there in 2 Kings 5, verse 13, it says, And his servants came near and spake unto him. So this is Naaman's servants. They're coming to speak, and it says, And his servants came near and spake unto him, and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou now have done it? How much rather when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now that I have, now that, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. You know, that's being a faithful servant. That's being a faithful leader. Naaman doesn't have to listen to his servants. It's not like today where everybody has a voice, right? I mean, I think that, that's some of, the, some of the challenge of today's society is everybody feels like they have a voice, and so they don't... Re- they come to him, first of all, they come to him in respect, but it takes... It's not just the fact that they came to him, but the fact that Naaman listened. I mean, think about it. He's wroth and he's angry. He's in a rage. He doesn't have to listen to anybody. Have you ever been in a rage? The last thing you want to do is listen to anybody tell you anything, Right? I mean, that's the worst time to have like a, a good discussion with your wife is when you and your wife are like in a bit of rage, right? You shouldn't, I, I've said that before, but you shouldn't pull out your Bible and tell your wife, you know, verses about being submissive when she's in the middle of like basically tearing your hair and, 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 and her hair out, right? But vice versa, like your wife shouldn't come to you and be like, oh, you need to, husbands love your wife like when you're in the middle of a rage, but that's what the servants do here. They come to Naaman and they're like, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would it not have done it? And so it doesn't say it here, but, and this is my opinion, and I think it's a fair opinion. I, I don't think I'm, I'm uh, you know, taking too much of a risk here. If Naaman is wroth and he leaves in rage, I don't think he's got that great of an attitude when he's dipping himself in the Jordan seven times. Like, I don't see Naaman, like, skipping in and, you know, like, zippity doo da. what a wonderful day. I, I mean, I see him more like, you know, when I tell my son that he can't do something and he's like, oh, you know, like, kind of, kind of have a bad attitude. That's why I love this picture, because he, he didn't have the greatest attitude to get not only his leprosy cleansed, but even to come to the Lord Jesus. I mean, he's, he compared the Jordan. He's like, this, is, this thing's nasty. 
you know, I wanted these nice rivers. It's kind of like here in Texas, you know, we don't really have great waters. The oceans are, you know, it's not like the Galveston Beach is the greatest beach. I mean, sorry, I know I'm a Texan too, but <laughs> the waters are murky. As a matter of fact, they're so murky that I think it was last year when, uh, you know, I guess the spring came in, the waters were so clear, it made all the news, and they were like telling everybody in Texas to come down to Galveston because you, you, we, we're never going to witness clear water for a while, right? I mean, it, so it's like telling someone from like Colorado where they have these real pristine lakes and nice, you know, water, hey, come and dip yourself in the Galveston waters. And they're kind of this bad attitude. You know what I mean? As a matter of fact, sometimes, you know, South Padre Island, because that's where I grew up, down in the border, with the, when the spring breakers are there, they tell the locals not to go because the water's so dirty, it's not even worth like jumping into the, the beach for, for a couple of, you know, for a couple of weeks. So it's kind of like that. So I don't, I don't envision Naaman having a great attitude. And the reason that's important is because that's the problem with adding works or mudding the water without, no pun intended, for salvation. It, it creates foolishness. Look, we need to be faithful that if God says you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't, don't second guess the thing. It's so, that's the biggest challenge we have. People get, become Christians and all of a sudden they're know-it-alls. I mean, I'll give it to Naaman. Despite all of it, he did it. You know, today some people might, have, might look at that and think, oh, I, I would never get mad. I'd have a better attitude, you know, but you, you, they wouldn't dip in the Jordan seven times. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it because, you know, it's not in their custom or whatever it is. And so we see here that he goes in and what does he say? And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Now go to Matthew 8, and, and I'll just touch a little bit on what happens afterwards. I love Elijah. Naaman's got money. I mean, he's kind of like second in command. And not only that, if you read in the beginning, he was sent with a lot of money. Like, a lot. Right? He says here in verse, you don't have to turn there, but uh, he says and in verse 5, And the king of Syria said, Go, go to... Go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. So now he didn't show up empty-handed. Even in today's, like I know we use dollars. If somebody shows up with ten thousand pieces of gold, that's going to be real tempting to some people. I'm going to tell you what, that's a lot of gold. Even if it was just like the coins, that's a lot of coin, you know, Proverbially, right? I mean, literally, it's a lot of coin. And Elijah's not impressed. And Naaman says, hey, let me, let me at least reward you. Let me pay you. And he's like, no thanks. And then Naaman, you know, obviously, he's still fresh, and he's going to go worship other places, and we could read on. Doesn't matter. I mean, he still, he, Elijah shows him grace. In, in the whole process. And what happens then, you know, I, I just wanted to touch on that real quick. Also, then we have Gehazi. He, you, sometimes the second command, he's like, hey man, we need to take that gold. So then he runs up, he meets Naaman later, and he takes the gold, and his punishment is that now he's a leper for life in his generations. Because he has a different attitude. And I just wanted to, you know, because I, I want to make sure that you guys get the whole story, but right there, we see that he's faithful. And go to Matthew 8, the Bible's the Bible tells us, talk, speaks of faithfulness. Matthew 8, verse 5 says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another man, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, 
I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus saith unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Here we have another picture of a great leader. See, Naaman, sometimes leadership, you know, has different traits. Naaman lost his temper, but he calmed down right away, got over it, listened to his people, and you know what? He did the thing. In this example, the centurion is like, hey, you don't even need to come to my house. I recognize authority when I see it because I'm a man who has a lot of authority. And I know that you have so much authority that if you say something needs to get done, it's going to get done. And what does Jesus say? Jesus marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. You know, if you're going to have faith and leadership and authority, it's because you have great faith. The centurion, he didn't even, have, he didn't even want to bother Jesus with the thing. But no, today, people want an audience. If they don't get an audience, if they don't get all their questions answered, or if they don't have the doctrine the way they, they read it in a book, they, they just won't show up at church. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I, I'm not going to touch on it again, but we had that one couple come in and visit us, and then they wanted an audience. They got the audience. They got all their, their questions answered, only to then say, you know what, never mind. Then you weren't, you're not wanting to listen to the Word of God. You're looking for your opinion based on what you think the Bible should do for you. You know, name and save by grace, because he has faith. And I mean, it's not always visible in the story. As a matter of fact, he's kind of got a bad attitude about it until the very end, right? And all of a sudden, I mean, it's like anything. Once you realize God's grace, you do get excited about it. I mean, I got saved when I was 25, and it's not till now, as I get older and I read my Bible more, that I realize, man, God's mercy and grace is amazing. Like, the fact that we're standing here right now in this country and we have the, the, the comforts and the wealth and the ability to preach God's word the way we do, that's amazing. People say, oh, I mean, because God's great. The, the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God, right? With, with everything we've got. And let me tell you something. I mean, at least I know I'm guilty of it. I don't know anybody who loves the Lord thy God with everything for 24 hours a day. So already... You messed up. You know, so when people go, go around ta talking to you about lordship, salvation, and this and that, you know, we need to look at what the Bible says. You know, in conclusion, what really triggered it is, the, so this, this gentleman calls me and he's giving me a hard time about my doctrine and about my beliefs. And, you know, that's what the devil's going to do. He's going to make you doubt what you believe so that you don't go around preaching God's word. You know what you need to do? You need to be grounded in God's word. So you're like Elijah, not impressed by anybody who knocks at, you know, at your door and says, Hey, I'm, I'm so-and-so, great, great, this and that. You know, my church is this big and I have a jet and you know, a nice car and a Rolls Royce, so I must know something. No, you just listen to the word of God. The, and then he, the, this individual, he's like, Hey, um, you know, the things that you're preaching are wrong. There's a book called The Enemies of Soul Winning by a preacher by the name of Jack Hiles. That book is bad, and you're, you sound just like that book. I mean, this is, what I'm, this is what the guy's telling me. I've never read the book, by the way, and I'm not endorsing the book one way or another. And by the way, if you know anything, I, and like I said, I don't endorse, uh, you know, I, don't, I didn't know Jack Hiles. I never went to his church. I know some of his ministry, but I know that he preached the right gospel. And I know that uh, he, he had a big soul winning team. And I know that I, I've looked at some of the stuff. I don't agree with like 100% of what he says or doctrines. But I went up and I looked up the book. Because, I mean, apparently I'm getting accused of something that's in a book that I've never read. And I'm not going to read the book for you. We'd be here all afternoon. But here's the table of contents. So this guy wrote a book. This is this preacher, Jack Hiles, about the enemies of soul winning. So you would think, I think that's a good book. You know, things that you shouldn't impede you from soul winning. And this is the table of contents. He says, these are enemies of soul winning, lordship salvation, ultra-dispensationalism, uh, 
formal worship, misunderstood repentance. Like I said, I'm not telling you I agree with all this 100%. I'm just telling you these, this is a table of contents. I'm reading it, right? False Bibles, which I actually I, I agree with. Uh, church leaders, opposition to pastoral leadership, uh, the universal church, the modern tongues movement, uh, and then I guess he just had other names. Where are the nine? Let's be Baptist and lifestyle evangelism. So he says these are enemies of soul winning, and the two that they focused on was repentance and lordship salvation. The, the people that are, or the, the gentleman is attacking me, and apparently it's people because he's getting sent emails about my preaching and all that stuff. Well, I said, you know what? I'm going to be gracious, and I'm not just going to write this guy off. Even though I've studied this stuff out, I'm going to go back and review it. So I look up Lordship Salvation. I mean, I run into all these preachers that are preaching. This stuff's, I mean, guys, there's no way that they set a standard that's impossible to meet. Salvation is by faith. It's by grace. It's free to all men. Now, I want the Lord Jesus to be my Lord. Let me tell you what, I do everything in my power to please the Lord, but that's not necessary for salvation. I think people have two things confused. You know, and that's the attack that the devil's going to do. He's going to try to convince you that somehow you just need to tweak it enough. They're always trying to add works to your salvation. And that's impossible. The finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross is all that is needed. People need to stop messing around with that stuff and need to start calling it out hardcore, even if you lose friendships, because that's a serious thing that sends people to hell. You know, what's interesting is I had a hard talk with this guy and he cleared up all his, you know, I, I finally got annoyed and I'm like, hey man, I'm like, first of all, I've never read this book. Second of all, the people you tell me I associate with, I associate with them just like I associate with you and people tell me about you that you're a false prophet. So what do you want me to do about the whole situation? And third of all, he clears up everything and guess what, it, what, it, what ends up being the conclusion? That salvation is by grace through faith. It's free gift. But they keep muddying the water. I don't want to muddy the water. I'd rather not mention things that are going to confuse people. You know, you want to learn false doctrine? Learn it after you get saved. Not before. Because you know what? I've been to houses where they want to argue these things. And you know what they don't do? They don't listen to this, that salvation message. They don't want to hear how it's, a, it's by grace. They don't want to hear that it's free. Because they want to first tell you how the Bible says, well, if you love me, you'll keep all my commandments. Well, yeah, if you're saved, you want to keep all his commandments. But it has nothing to do with your salvation. I don't know what you're talking about. And then the other one that I got, that, that I got called out for was the misunderstood repentance, you know, that I don't like saying repent of your sins. I, I cleared that up. Hey, and he says, you don't believe in repentance. Absolutely I do. The Bible says that we need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The, Bible, the word repent just means that I, I don't trust in myself or in a church or in saints or in works. I changed my mind. The only thing I believe in is Jesus Christ. Simple. I can't, I mean, I, after salvation, repentance of sin is important. You should repent of, of sins. Like if you commit a sin, you should go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness and repent of that sin. But you know what? Sometimes you repent of a sin, and then guess what? Ten minutes later, you're committing it all over again. Have you ever done that? I'm not going to do this. You know, the, uh, here's a great example. Have you ever met someone who got drunk the night before, maybe in your youth? And they're like, man, I got so drunk. I'm never going to drink again in my life. And what do they do like the next weekend? Drink again, again and again. Right? I mean, that was like the most common thing I heard growing up because, you know, I, I went to a secular college and so I had friends and, and buddies and they'd go out and do that and they'd get really drunk and then the, they, they, the next day at school they're like hung over and they're like, I'm never going to drink again in my life. And you know what? We'd make fun of them because we're like, you're a liar. You're going to drink again. You're probably going to drink again tonight. You know, they came repentant of the fact that they were never going to do that. They changed their mind. They're like, I don't want to do that ever again. And then you fall into the the same pit. So, you know, I just want to clear that up. I don't know if, if this guy's here and maybe you get, I want to make sure you guys know where we stand, where I stand. The reason that, you know, we've, we've attended this church is because Pastor Cobb, this church doesn't muddy the waters. We might not agree 100% on everything. You know, whatever, you, people will always want to find fault. The fact of the matter is the things that are important are clear. 
The things that aren't, I mean, Pastor Cobbs told me that he believes that the, that the Antichrist is, is going to be from Syria. And he showed me the verses. He, you've almost got me convinced, Pastor, but I'm not sure if I'm... But I don't know if I necessarily... But that has nothing to do with anything. You know, and I'll find out if he's right or if I'm right in the future. But when it comes to salvation, it's important. And we've had people in here who claim to believe, be, believe in Jesus Christ, claim all that stuff, and Pastor Cobb will talk to him afterwards, and he kicks him out. I mean, I remember a few years back, I remember those Pentecostal guys that wanted to use our church, and they, like, promised the big uh, Spanish service. I, I'd love it if we could fill it. And they had, like, 20 people here. You know, the whole family was here, and we were excited. We're like, man, we're going to have a great Spanish ministry. And then all of a sudden, they started talking about speaking in tongues, and, you know, spiritual baptism and all that stuff. And Pastor Cobb was just like, just, he was nice about it. He actually showed him a lot of grace. He wasn't like, he didn't run him out. There was like, most of you didn't even know. But he ran him off. Amen. We want to be clear. He could have gotten taken for that. I mean, who doesn't want a bigger congregation? Honestly, that's why we preach. We like preaching to people. But not at the expense of the gospel. Not at the expense of the gospel. Who wouldn't want more tithes? You know, that's what the churches worry about, right? More people, more tithes, but not at the expense of the gospel. As a matter of fact, Elijah said, no, thank you. I don't need your money. I don't need your money because if I take your money, then it's no longer by my faith, right? It's no longer by works. So, I mean, I don't know. Just That really got to me. Um, I just do want to close out with this. If you go to Hebrews 1, it's not part of my message, but I just, I didn't want to forget it. If you go to Hebrews 1. And it says there in verse 13, But to which the angel said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool, question mark, and he says, are they not all, speaking of the angels, in verse 14 of, of Hebrews 1, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? It's talking about those who are going to be heirs of salvation, right? We see that the Lord delivered Syria because Naaman, he had found favor in the Lord. Look, we need to have a heart for soul winning and we need to go out there and preach the gospel to everybody because we don't know the work that God's doing for other people. Elijah could have just had a different attitude but Elijah knew the gospel message. Number one, he showed Naaman who was more important in his life. I mean, if you want to go there, Jesus, right? God. He didn't even come out to meet him but number two, even afterwards, Naaman kind of, he kind of goes back to his old ways because he just got saved and he wants to go to these like other church, like other gods and everything. And Elijah doesn't just rebuke him right away because he already knows the Spirit's working in him. And we get, sometimes we get up here and we get a little, we get a little pointy. We, we start to separate out scripture and Old Testament and New Testament and this verse and that verse and all that. And the reason I, I like the title is name is saved by grace is because it doesn't matter if it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, you're saved by grace. Period. End of story. If you want to add a bunch of titles in front of it or be behind it, do it, but you're just going to muddy the waters. And you, we can argue all the other points, and the, you know, I could even argue books with you if you want, but first, I want to make sure you're not going to hell. The challenge is everybody wants to get on their high horse and tell you how good or bad you should preach. And they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, I'll sit here and argue scripture with you all day long. But first be saved. Man, as a matter of fact, that's one of my favorite things to do. My wife knows it. I've stayed up till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning going, you know, about doctrine this and believe that and, you know, verse this and verse that. But you better be saved. And then we can sit there and talk about anything you want. But don't muddy the waters before. So, you know, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord. Thank you so much for today. Thank you that Pastor Cobb was able to be here with us. 
And Lord, just put your healing hand on him. And not only on him, Lord, but all those on the puny list. Lord, the one thing that we know is uh, no matter where we are in our health or in our finances or in the trials of life, if we're saved, we're saved by grace. We will never taste death. And this is a light affliction. And so we, we need not be afraid to stand on your promises and just preach the word as clear as your salvation is, as easy as your salvation is. There's no hard thing in the Bible to preach. Now, it might be hard to be understood, but worst case, I can at least read the verses, and then people can know that that's what your word says. So thank you for uh, today. Be with those who weren't able to be here. Thank you for those that are present. Just show us your grace and your mercy in our lives. Continue to help us to grow and to edify our brothers and sisters in Christ. And give us a good week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.